All right. Welcome back to my home office students. As I said during lecture today, I was only able to get through chapters 13, 14, and 15 of Ulysses, but we must complete our nostos, our homecoming to chapters 16, 17, 18. I'll try and keep the narrative pace, the professorial pace that I started in class today. Um, okay, so let's talk about chapter 16, which is called Eumaeus. It takes place at 1 a.m. and is the first of three chapters of the third part of Ulysses called the Nostos. Remember, the first part was also three chapters, the Telemachia of, of, of um, Stephen Daedalus. The next 12 chapters or so, chapters 4 to 15, Calypso to Circe, were the wanderings of Ulysses. So, of course, we also saw the wanderings of our Telemachus character. Um, uh, Stephen Daedalus. Um, and now we are entering the so-called home stretch. So I'll quote from the beginning of chapter 16, the Eumaeus chapter. Preparatory to anything else, Mr. Gloom brushed off the greater bulk of the shavings and handed Stephen the hat and ash plant and buffed him up generally in orthodox Samaritan fashion, which he very badly needed. His, Stephen's mind, was not exactly what you would call wandering, but a bit unsteady in his expressed desire for some beverage to drink. Mr. Bloom, in view of the hour, it was, and there being no pump of Vartry water available for their ablutions, let alone drinking purposes, hit upon an expedient by suggesting, off the reel, the propriety of the cabman's shelter. As it was called, hardly a stone throw away near butt bridge, where they might hit upon some drinkables in the shape of a milk and soda or a mineral. So let's recall that we've just been in chapters 14 and 15 in the so-called Oxen of the Sun, which took place in the National Hospital, as well as in Night Town, the, um, the red light district of Dublin, and in the uh the the and in the establishment, I suppose I should say, of Bella Cohen, where Stephen lost the remainder of his friends and Bloom experienced a very interesting um, phantasmagoric experience, as well as Stephen. Um, so now Stephen's friends have abandoned him and he is alone with Bloom. What is the connection to Eumaeus, the name of this chapter? Well, Eumaeus in Homer's Odyssey is himself a slave who came from, who, who originally was from a, a much better, came from a much better situation. He was himself from either a royal or rich family and was stolen by a slave who was of the same people as a band of pirates who visited his land. He was then stolen by the slave um, uh, and taken aboard the pirate ship in order to be sold um, for sold back to his people for great wealth. However, the woman died, unfortunately, and the pirates took him and sold him to Laertes, the father of Odysseus. So he is a person of noble birth, but he has found himself in ignoble circumstance as himself being the swineherd of Odysseus, a noble lord. During Odysseus's absence, apparently Eumaeus has been very kind to Odysseus's um, pigs, but also to his son Telemachus. And in fact, when Telemachus first makes it back to Ithaca and Odysseus is incognito in disguise, uh, Telemachus runs to Eumaeus, treats him like a father, and in fact calls him father multiple times. So he has been a figure of fatherhood for Telemachus. And so perhaps the Eumaeus in this chapter is something like Bloom. Um, there's something worth thinking about as you prepare your final essays. Um, to Ulysses itself. In the cab shelter, Bloom is described as Stephen's fetus Socrates. This is a learned reference to the Aeneid. Um, fetus, like Semper Fidelis, the motto of the Marines, always faithful, means faithful itself. It's really a root word. And Acades is the good friend of Aeneas, who is himself described as faithful and is often alongside him, at least in the first half of the Aeneid. And so now Bloom is described as having a very faithful a uh, kind friendship-like relationship to Stephen, very much unlike the friends who abandoned Stephen um, prior to him going to Bella Cohen's. Um, and this is something that uh, the Bloom brings up with Stephen. He says, well, your friends abandoned you. And, and Stephen responds, and that one was Judas. So recall that Judas, of course, is the apostle who betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, and, and in Dante's Inferno is the arch center in hell. It's the, um, there are three 
mouths of Satan at the bottom of um, Dante's Inferno in Canto 34. And in the front, the middle front one, with his head being chewed on, his back being scratched for all eternity is Judas, Cassius, and Brutus on the right and left. Um, so he, so for Buck Mulligan to be described as Judas is to suggest that he is very much the opposite of Fetus Occupus. And it's almost as if Stephen is finally starting to, though he's quite drunk, get his head on straight about who his real friends actually are. During the course of their conversation, they talk about several things in both this chapter and the next chapter. But Bloom also shows uh, Stephen a picture of Molly, and so we get to see Molly through his eyes as well. They discuss music. Bloom likes Mercadante, an Italian composer, and thinks Mozart is preeminent in his abilities, though he thinks Wagner is a bit much. If you listen to Rise, uh, Ride of the Valkyries, perhaps you will agree with him. Uh, Stephen mentions that he likes the songs of Shakespeare as well as a German folk song called, which he describes as the book, or at least one line of it, perhaps is the title, is The Voices of Sirens, Sweet Murderers of Men, which make, uh, which makes Bloom wrinkle his brow at it. In this particular chapter, too, there's a figure of Odysseus that is perhaps supposed to lead our, our thoughts astray. There's a red-haired character named W.B. Murphy, who has been away from his home for seven years and is going back to his wife. It sounds a lot like a, a lot like Odysseus, though I will encourage you potentially to see him more as a Menelaus who was himself uh, known to be red-haired and spent something like seven years in Egypt or off the coast of Egypt on the island of Pharos before he made it home um, with his wife. But whether he ever truly came home with Helen or not is uh, the sort of question one might ask a lot, uh, analogous to can one ever go back to one's home. It, is the home that Odysseus returns to 20 years later the same? Are Mel Menelaus and Helen returning something like 17 years later, are they even the same couple that they, they were? Not to mention the fact that there is an alternative story that Helen never made it to Troy. In fact, it, there was a cloud made in her form that she and Achilles stayed in Egypt. But that is, uh, that's neither here nor there. One thing about W.B. Murphy's claim to being Odysseus that perhaps um, sheds some light on it or, or picks holes in his claim is that when Bloom asks him questions about his travels, he, he doesn't give descriptive answers. He refuses to answer, answer. Though he enjoys saying fantastic things and talking about a uh, crocodile attacking, attacking the ship and a uh, man being eaten alive that he saw by a shark, um, when asked questions about where he's been and what he's seen, he gives non-committal answers. So is this figure himself, who seems himself literally very similar to Odysseus in that he is a seaman who has been gone from home for many years and is returning to his wife and has seen many wild things, is he more like Odysseus than, say, Bloom, who is described as not having traveled very far at all, I think just past the English Channel, um, and but but has an adventurous spirit and like to travel. Which one of these figures is more like uh, more like Odysseus, and which one is more superficially like Odysseus? Um, is something that I would I would want you to think of. Well, just to add to the physical elements of the things we've talked about, like at the end of the Nausicaa uh, chapter, or rather in the middle of it, um, um, mentioning the onanism of. Bloom, uh, having mentioned earlier during our, our the Calypso episode, his defecation. Another uh, sordid and potentially extremely modernist and realist detail is that after both Stephen and Bloom together leave the cabin shelter, they take a carriage towards Bloom's home, and the horse stops uh, and drops before they get to Seven Apple Street. Three smoking globes of Hurts. Again, it's sort of a vulgar and uh, nasty moment in the text, and yet a, a moment uh, that I think leads uh, leads one to interpret this text more realistically than idealistically. Obviously, if this were an idealist text, we would not get these ordinary details. But in order to represent a true day, the true life of and spirit of a human, perhaps these details must be included. Perhaps these two are the most I mean details, not just the thoughts we have about the ineluctable modality of the visible, 
for the Audible, like um, Stephen has both in chapters 15 and 3, but also but also um, uh, the sordid little details that we would keep from someone else if we were writing our own personal history or chronicle. On to the second chapter of the Nostos. Chapter 17, Ithaca, 2 a.m. Something I should say immediately about the understanding of Ithaca and the Odyssey is that Odysseus makes it to Ithaca with something like 10 out of 24 books remaining in the Odyssey. Though he makes it back to Ithaca, he has not yet made it home. He must spend those two books acquiring uh, allies making um uh committing espionage against his enemies and planning his attack and so though he makes it to the place where his home is potentially um at least physically speaking he still has a lot of work to do before he has made it home and so perhaps there is a correlate here between this ithaca chapter and the penelope chapter that follows it Note also that we've made it from 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. It is getting quite late slash early in the day. I'll quote now from the beginning of chapter 17. What parallel courses did Bloom and Stephen follow returning, starting united both, both at normal walking pace from Beresford or Beresford Place? They followed in, order, in the order named Lower and Middle Gardner Streets and Mountjoy Square West. Then, at reduced pace, each baron left Gardner's place by an inadvertence as far as the farther corner of Temple Street. Then at reduced pace with interruptions of halt bearing right, Temple Street North as far as Hardwick Place. Approaching disparate at relaxed walking pace, they crossed both the circus before George's church diametrically, the cord in any circle being less than the arc which it subtends, of course. This is a chapter I claim of presence and denial. Stephen and Bloom are finally home, and though we've had some moments of hearing insight in, into the conversation of Stephen and Bloom, Stephen was pretty drunk in the last chapter, and we didn't get to hear much of his particular voice in chapter 14, The Oxen of the Sun. Now that we finally get to see these two, with some relative level of sobriety, Bloom is sober and very much dead sober at this point. Instead of having access to the direct narrative, we have a narrator who is called the catechist. And, and this is because this chapter is written in catechistic format. What is catechistic format? It is question answer format. Um, so a question is put and then an answer is given. And uh, we do learn a great deal about these characters, but, but I think if you've been really following this text closely and have come to develop a relationship with Stephen, and realize that chapter 18 will feature um, will feature Molly's voice alone. This is the last chance that we get to hear from Bloom and Stephen, and we don't hear from them at all. We hear through the intermediary of a catechistic narrative. So though we learn a great deal about them and what they talk about, we don't experience directly what they talk about, which to me, as a, a lover of this text and a, a teacher of it now, um, it creates an insuperable narrative distance that causes a poignant feeling of pain. Um, this should be the climax of the text, far more than the Circe chapter is. Um, this should be the great moment of reunification between these two characters in the same way that Telemachus and Odysseus experience a great reunification and then fight alongside each other against the suitors and then the suitors' families. Um, Stephen will leave. In the middle of this chapter, he will he will not agree to stay at Bloom's home, and and he does not necessarily agree to teach Molly Italian to stay in Bloom's life. It is very much undefined what his next step will be. We don't even know where he is going to go to sleep at the end of the night, and he doesn't even accept the opportunity to sleep at Bloom's at uh, very very late at night. Um, and and in fact, one of the reasons that Bloom, after Stephen leaves chooses to stay in his home because he has a big choice ahead of him, whether he is going to go back to his room and lay it, lay himself in the bed that has been spoiled by Blaze's Boylan and Molly that afternoon and also some potted meat. Um, one of the reasons that he doesn't go out is that it's dangerous at night. 
And so Stephen will subject himself to those dangers while hopefully having sobered up quite a bit. Um, okay. Bloom makes Stephen some cocoa and puts cream in it that's usually reserved for Molly. This is a detail I want to note because a question asked in the text is whether Stephen notices the hospitality being offered to him. During the course of today, there have been many people who attempt to usurp the talent of, of, of Stephen Buck Mulligan, Mr. DC, Miles Crawford. Then again, later, the friends uh, and uh, of, of Stephen Douglas as well as Bella Cohen trying to absorb his substance, his money from him. Stephen is finally being treated here according to the value that he has by somebody who, like him, is special and cultured and can see what is special about him. Though it may have been the case that many people of lesser character than Bloom have mistreated Stephen throughout the course of the day, the value of the person who is treating him well speaks to the value of Stephen's own character. Perhaps if he reciprocates that to Bloom, that will tell us something about the value of Bloom's character in the wake of the many denigrations he's faced today, particularly those by um, the, the prejudice and racist citizen. What is it, though we are denied direct access to it, that Bloom and Stephen talk about? Well, I just have a few of the topics they talk about here that I thought were very interesting. They compare their ages, for example. Bloom is 38. And Stephen is 22. When talks about what he was doing at 22 to prepare himself to Stephen, they're sort of palling around. And he even remembers having met Stephen a couple times before, one of these times when he was quite young with his mother. And um, and this is something essential about Bloom's intellect. He, he has an excellent memory and a mind for detail, which suggests that his mind is a, a cut above the average. He remembers that though he met Stephen, Stephen refused to give him his hands on that first day. And so he he remembers this detail about Stephen. He, he has an excellent memory and an excellent mind for details. Bloom, uh, we find out, used to have another job as a cattle salesperson. So he, uh, uh, he has worked multiple careers. We also learn a little bit about Bloom's books, um, including a book on of Spinoza's writings, which I, I highly encourage you to read, The Ethics by Spinoza, as well as his Theologico Politico treatise, um, they, they'll certainly change your lives in the same way that Ulysses has the power to change your life. And then also the and for, I think perhaps the first circus strongman, Eugen Sando, which is called Strength and How to Obtain It. This is a book that I have owned in my past and is actually quite interesting. Um, pretty short book too, but he uses that in order to learn how to be fit. We do later find out that he has measured his biceps and his chest before. So Bloom has some care for fitness and hygiene in the way that uh, Stephen does not. And, and this is something else that they talk about. Bloom really wants to encourage Stephen to bathe and eat, to bathe more and to eat at more appropriate hours. These small details may seem unimportant to an intellectual like Stephen, but ultimately these details matter. And will be of service to him in his life and profession to, to observe it. Also, Bloom has several histories and chronicles of history, and his books are well bound too. Something you may not know is that in the early 20th century, a mark of the value of the book was often how well bound it was because the authors themselves had to pay for the buying of books. There's a similar process today with fiction writers that they too often have to pay some degree uh, when they're un when they're untested, when they are, are un the first time that they've ever written, the, uh, a publishing house is not necessarily willing to uh, drop lots of money on an untested author who might not sell. And so sometimes, oftentimes, an author must dig into his own pocket. So something which has changed, but perhaps not as much as one would think without knowing the details. Um, all right, something else I just want you to know that isn't, doesn't necessarily occur in this chapter is that um, Bloom did once write up uh, a plan for Irish independence based on Hungarian independence, just something that one should know to measure that against the citizens' understanding of him. New Jerusalem, he claims, and talking about injustice. Um, Bloom is very much an Irish person who cares about other Irish people and Ireland um, being the place that it wants to be and people being proud of it. He thinks about the preeminent intellects of Maimonides, or he talks about, excuse me, with Stephen, the preeminence of Maimonides, 
um, one of the greatest Jewish philosophers, Spinoza. But one of them is one, one of them is two, I would say. Um, the one is medieval and one is modern. Um, Maimonides comes earlier than Spinoza, but they engage with each other. And then Moses Mendelssohn, whom uh, Bloom has considered many times throughout the course of his text. They continue to share with each other and develop their relationship. Stephen writes Irish characters, which delight Bloom. Bloom then writes Hebrew characters, which delight, uh, which delight Stephen. They're sharing with each other um, in a sort of vulgar way. They end up micturating with each other, which is a sophisticated way of saying that they urinate alongside each other. In fact, streams of both their various uh, urine are described. Bloom was supposedly a champion at this that we learn and a, a, a mark of the hyper or in an instance of the hyper realism of this text. And then Stephen leaves. And after Stephen leaves, in some ways, this opens the floodgates for Bloom. Uh, if Stephen had stayed, Bloom could have shifted his focus from the impending conflict with Molly and the very complicated situation he finds himself in socially and perhaps legally, um, being, being made a cuckold of in what may end up being a fairly public way may have huge social repercussions the same way that it had huge social repercussions for Charles Stewart Parnell. It may also have legal repercussions um, down the line, depending on how Bloom decides to deal with the situation. Though, though he does think very clearly um, after he gets to the bed of Molly, divorce, not now. So after Stephen leaves, Bloom thinks of how can he keep up his intellect? He thinks of studying folk tales, comparative religion, or astronomy, uh, very sophisticated topics. He thinks also of his father's suicide note to him and how his father had conveyed to him that he no longer wished to live after the death of Bloom's mother, whom we've heard so little about during the course of this text, but who was obviously such a, a great influence on the life of, of Virag Bloom, um, Bloom's father. Um, we Curiously, we also hear very little about Molly's mother, who was herself a Spanish Jewess, as she describes her from Gibraltar. She, she was very much raised as a Catholic from her sergeant mate by her sergeant major father. So it's unclear whether her mother died in childbirth or was left by her father who was stationed in Gibraltar um, during his military service, or whether that was um, sort of a, a, the archetypal Madame Butterfly military wedding. They had a child, but they never married. And, um, the, the child was taken home with the father for a better life. Um, I would be interested to look into scholarship about that, what, what ideas people have. And I'd be very interested in your ideas on that, too. Bloom finally decides that he is going to go into his room. And what does he find there in bed? Well, he finds the imprint of a man, as well as a woman, but the woman is there, Molly, and it expected. The man is boiling. He is not there anymore. Though Molly wishes that he were there and thinks about how that she wishes she could wake up with them and is very much looking forward to Monday when she will see him again. So to what extent is this it's an ironic representation of Odysseus killing the suitors and then lying with his wife, who had, by lying with his wife, uh, copulating with his wife after she has maintained a pristine marriage bed, which only he knows about because he built uh, the bed with a post uh, attached to an olive tree. Well, here... Not only has Bloom not slayed the suitor, there's evidence that the suitor has despoiled his bed, unlike in the Odyssey, opposite to the Odyssey, and the suitor's still around. And he may still have to deal with it. So this is, uh, Bloom finds himself in a different situation, though related. Uh, to add insult to injury, we know how clean uh, Bloom is and how much he has a clean eater and how he likes uh, uh he appreciates a moral pub in fact um and so what does he find besides the imprint of the man in his bed he finds crumbs of potted meat which he cleans his, which he cleans off not the evidence of the fruits that blazes had sent to molly that one might have expected to see 
He then thinks divorce, not now. And he kisses Molly's rump, which Molly in the next chapter will think that he perhaps did because he was feeling erotic uh, feelings towards her because he had seen his old flame Josie Powell earlier, whom he did see. Um, we also receive here a confirmation that it has been, in fact, 10 years, five months, 18 days since carnal intercourse had been uh, complete, or rather carnal intercourse had been incomplete for 10 years, five months, and 18 days. And as we lose access to Bloom's consciousness through this catechistic format, he falls asleep thinking of Sinbad, of all characters, of a character himself remarkably similar to uh, Odysseus. And so we then find ourselves in chapter 18, the final chapter of the text, the final chapter of the third part of the text, the Gnosis. This is Penelope. And I've mentioned many of these details before, but something about Penelope is that she had the child Telemachus. Uh, very shortly after, Odysseus went to Troy for a 10-year-long war. After that, he spent 10 years making it home. During that time, she was extremely chaste, and though in alternative accounts, she may have spent some time with Antinous or Anthemus, in the Odyssey, she is totally chaste. And in fact, spends three years uh, weaving and unweaving a shroud for Laertes, the father of Odysseus, in order to keep the suitors from attempting to marry her. Her conceit is that she will marry as soon as she is finished with this shroud, but every night she unweaves what she has already woven until one of her serving maids, likely one of the serving maids who was developing an erotic relationship with the suitor, one of the suitors, uh, um, gives up her secret to the suitors. Um, and so Penelope is, is then loses her sort of totem against the suitors just as Odysseus returns home, which makes some commentators wonder whether um, she recognizes Odysseus even in disguise um, when she does see him. Something worth considering if you read the office. In any case, let me begin with the beginning of chapter 18, Penelope, which is late night, early morning, you don't have a time. Yes, which is uh, of course, the, fi the first word of this chapter and the final word of this chapter. Yes, because he never did a thing like that before, as asked to get his breakfast in bed with a couple of eggs since the City Arms Hotel when he used to be pretending to be laid up with a sick voice doing his highness to make himself interesting for that old faggot Mrs. Reardon that he thought he had a great leg of, and she never left us a farthing. All for masses for herself and her sole greatest miser ever, was actually afraid to lay out 4D for her methylated spirit, telling me all her ailments. She had too much old chatting her about politics and earthquakes and the end of the world. Let us have a bit of fun, a bit of fun first. God help the world. If all women were her sort, down on bathing suits and low necks, of course, nobody wanted her to warm them, I suppose. She was pious because no man would look at her twice. I hope I'll never be like her. A wonder she didn't go, she didn't want us to cover our faces, but she was. Dot, dot, dot. In this chapter, we finally get the voice of our third main character, Molly Bloom. In this chapter as well, there are five sentences as described by James Joyce, as well as two grammatical periods, as well as one menstrual period, which breaks out in the middle of it. Uh, inter interestingly enough, this is something that supposedly made Gertie McDowell feel ticklish that she had the oncoming an oncoming menstrual period, and uh, also obviously um, Molly Bloom was feeling somewhat ticklish today, and inviting uh, Blaze Boylan into her her bed. And so Joyce seems to have some interesting idea about uh, a, a relationship between the onset of uh, menstruation and eroticism and female eroticism, which um, I don't know where he got that from, but it does, it is present in this text. So what is it that Molly Bloom, now that we have access to her consciousness, thinks about? I can't go into all of it because we don't have time, but I'll mention a couple things. She does mention and think about three men at the very least, Blaze Boylan, Leopold Bloom, and her first ever lover who who died after going, I, I think to Africa, but it may have been to India in order to make his fortune. And when she thinks of Boylan, she thinks of the determined, vicious look on his face and the size of him, and that she did not, uh, in fact, allow him to finish the act inside of her. 
Um, and so she she is not pregnant, which is part of what the oncoming of menstruation uh, indicates to her as well. Um, she also criticizes him in terms of the fact that he took his clothes off in front of her without asking her. He um, lewdly uh, slaps her buttocks. Um, she doesn't. He does not treat her with the sort of respect and dignity that she thinks she deserves. And she thinks um, appreciatingly about Bloom, the fact that he, he takes his shoes off before he enters the house. It's a fastidious individual. And uh, Boylan is a less cultivated individual, a more, a more boisterous, a uh, vulgar um, person. And so he's very proud of him. So he's very hairy and he stands in front of her in his half shirt like they do as she describes and and, and makes a show of himself and um while also clearly being uh giving in to his extraordinary um lust and passion uh, how much that has to do with molly herself or the fact that she's simply a woman in a don giovanni sort of way is something that one might well think about Though she thinks so much about Blazes and has obviously copulated with Blazes today and has not copulated with Bloom, perhaps due to Bloom's own fault the last 10 years, she thinks that Holdy has more spunk in her when she thinks of bearing another child. And her thoughts continue to return to, to, uh, to Leopold um, at, as she's going as she is going through her soliloquy, as it's called, this uh, long um, internal monologue that we have access to. Um, there is something different, ultimately, about Bloom. There's something that attracts her to Bloom. There's something that makes her think that if she were going to have another child, which she doesn't think she will, in a very sort of Helen of Troy way, rather than Penelope way, though it is the case that Penelope doesn't have another child uh, in the Odyssey, but again, there are alternative accounts. Um, it is well. In any case, it is Bloom that captures her imagination. Or Bloom that has something special about him. All the little denigrations that he's faced. During the course of this day, most people ha have not, you know, have gone to Ruben J. Martin Cunningham gives him the look. It's mentioned later that he must have made a winning on throwaway, this 20 to 1 odds horse, when in fact he was just going to throw away his newspaper and had made no money. So people continually have the wrong idea of when Bloom is working to help Patty Dignam's widow and he lets Hines off the hook in turn terms of a debt and he's trying to help Stephen and so though the people around him perhaps do not recognize his value to them the people who are close to them like Molly and uh, perhaps nascently with or developingly with Stephen these people themselves of quality seem to recognize that there's something more to them that there's something uncommon that he as I like to say, that there may be something that, a cut above about him, though it's difficult to put into words what exactly that would be for these characters. So I would mention that there's just that his character is superior to those um, of those around him. In fact, uh, his house is so well ordered, though perhaps not perfectly so, as we've seen, that he can provide for his wife and then make dinner for her, and then perhaps even attempt to provide for a young man who who himself needs. Who, who needs to provide for himself. It, it is no longer appropriate for Stephen to be the son of anybody, um, whether spiritual, literary son of Shakespeare, or he needs to become his own author, or or, or sort of physical, um, spiritual son of Bloom. He, it is time for him to be a father and to father his own. In any case, speaking of fathers, let's now run, jump to the end of this text and the final quote in it. Molly's thoughts return ultimately to Bloom and the first and when he proposed to her. And, and so one wonders whether this ending marks um, the end of the relationship between Molly and Bloom or a new beginning. Is it the fact that this terrible moment, which 
Traditionally, if this were Madame Bovary or Anna Karenina or a 19th century novel would result in the ruining of Molly and her subsequent death, perhaps by suicide or by uh, uh, or by poisonous suicide, depending on uh, which archetype was being followed. One wonders whether this text, as sophisticated as it is, does not indicate that the normal operations, cheating, ruining, leaving, death, will not be followed. It perhaps, or maybe this, this was the moment that was necessary for Bloom and Somali to break out of a 10 year long stasis, a 10 year long journey, psychological journey that has kept them away from each other. Whether this act itself, which has mean some, meant something completely opposite to what it means in this situation historically, will be the catalyst or or create the crisis, which finally brings them back together. So I, I leave you with that question as I quote, oh, and see the sea crimson sometimes like fire, the glorious sunsets and the fig trees and the Alameda gardens, yes. And all the queer little streets and the pink and blue and yellow houses and the rose gardens and the jessamine and geraniums and cactuses and Gibraltar as a girl, where I was a flower of the mountain, yes, when I put the rose in my hair, like the Andalusian girls used to, or shall I wear a red, yes. And how he kissed me under the Moorish wall. And I thought, well, as well him as another. And then I asked him with my eyes to ask again, yes. And then he asked me, would I say yes to yes, my mountain flower? And first I put my arms around him, yes and drew him down to me so he could feel my breasts all perfume. Yes, his heart was going like mad. And yes, I said, yes, I will, yes. And so the text and the chapter ends with an affirmation the same way that this chapter began with an affirmation. Is Molly saying, what is Molly saying yes to here? Is it a reestablishment of carnal relations and an appropriate marital relationship between her and Bloom, or is it yes to something totally new? That's what we have time for today. Thank you for joining me on this romp through Ulysses, this trunket through it.